Good morning, fellow Toastmasters and potential Toastmasters. Welcome to Wake Up with Toastmasters. Hope you had a great holiday and you're now, I know many of you are getting ready to get back to work and you've decided to spend some time with us on Wake Up with Toastmasters and we appreciate that. Yesterday, we started a discussion with Land by Phyllis on what the role of the chief judge is now that it's contest season. And most of you may know that Phyllis is a very experienced chief judge. She has served in that role at every level, uh, at least nine or 10 times from all the way from area to division to district. So she is very well experienced and she has a wealth of uh, knowledge about this topic. So we're just going to, I'm just going to turn it over to Phyllis and let her continue on with, with her discussion of the role of the chief judge in contest season. So if you haven't joined us, join us online, send me your questions, and we'll make sure that they get answered. Phyllis, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Ken. We had several questions yesterday. And with being the chief judge, I think the most important thing is that you give a thorough judge's briefing, that you tell them everything that you want them to know uh, about being a judge. It's almost like a very brief, brief mini judging session on learning how to be a, chief, a judge. So since we had so many questions, I did download the current judge's certificate of certification of eligibility and code of ethics. And I thought maybe we would spend some time actually going over this piece of paper. This is a contract. Bear in mind, it will always be a contract between you and Toastmasters that you're going to do your level best. So let me share the screen and see if I can. Um, Pull this up. Let me see here. There it is. The judges certification code of ethics. Code of ethics. I always try to underline that because we're going to talk about that. Because the, the top, you know, is just something to say what contest you're in. And if we're doing two area contests, I like to have one for each area. Phyllis, excuse me one minute. Uh -huh. uh, can you make that larger at the top? Maybe do a full screen and over 100% because on the page, it's not very clear. Hold on. Okay. How's that, uh, one? that should be much. Very good. Thank that, you. That look good? Yeah, that's good on our page. I think everybody can see it now. Okay. Okay. So if we're doing like one area, and the evaluation and the international, I take just one of these. But if we're doing two areas, I like to have the information from each area. I don't know that there's a ruling on it. You know, it's just the way I like it. And this does not pass on. You do this new each and every time at every contest. When we talk about the eligibility, someone asked me yesterday, well, what is the eligibility for a chief judge? And the chief judge must meet all of this criteria to be a chief judge, a voting judge, or a tiebreaker judge at a speech contest. So at the club level, okay, a, pay, a paid member. Uh, yeah, just about everybody in the club is, uh, can be a judge. At the area, you should be a member for at least six months. I'm sorry, Phyllis, one last thing there. It looks like you see this uh, uh, up in the corner here to make it full screen. In your full screen, you see where my, can you click on that? I think that'll help. Uh, I'm sorry, one of these. Try this one right here. See where my. No, I can't okay. see where you're at. Never mind. Don't worry about it. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. It's not, it's not bad. I was just trying to improve some clarity, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't play around with it enough this morning, evidently. 
but you must be a paid member for six months of a club that's in good standing. You should have completed at least six speeches uh, or have level two. And this level two must be completed and uh, given, which means that you applied for level two and you received level two. So that if anybody looks at your information on uh, Toastmasters website, they'll see that you have level two. We're not gonna talk about the region semifinals. It's just that this is something that uh, information, it applies. So this same certification is going to be used throughout and all the way up to uh, the World Championship of Public Speaking. So there are a couple things here that, that we are not interested in. Okay, any member of the area could be uh, a judge. We like to have at least five judges at each contest. We like to have them dispersed among, uh, if it's divisions, then one from each division, or if it's areas, then one from every club. So naturally, the judge and the contestant are going to be from the same club or should be. A little story about that is I had one judge tell me that he was there to vote for his uh, club member. We went into great detail about, no, that was not why he was here. Not to vote just for his club member. If you go beyond the club level, they are not a eligible to compete in the same contest type and the same, during the same contest cycle. So it says a little player there, but what I'm saying is, that if you are competing anywhere in the district or the world in the international contest and you are on your way to the next level, then you cannot be a judge in the international contest. Now, if you've been in the international contest and you lost, then you can be a judge at the international contest. So we want to also watch that we do not have judges that are in the same clubs as the contestants. This takes a bit of work by the chief judge, but usually what I do is I ask for a membership list. I alphabetize it, find all my contestants, write down all the clubs they're in. And sometimes I've had them be in as high as six clubs. Then you need to find a judge that is from the division, but not in any clubs with the contestants. It is sometimes challenging. So, they should not be competing in the same clubs and same, I'm sorry, same type of contest. And they had division and, or, and higher. They cannot be a member of the club of one of the contestants. So if I am in Windjammers and I am competing, but uh, Ken is actually a member in another club, Early Risers, okay? I'm in Early Risers. He could not be a judge because although he's not in the same club as I am, he is in a club with me. And this sometimes gets challenging, especially at the district level because the contestant may be in many clubs and maybe there's not a club in that division 
that appears. I had the, for instance, of one um, contestant in the evening uh, contest, international, I assume, and everybody that appeared at the district level uh, as a visitor member was in her club. And the only person that I could find that was not in a club with her that could be a judge from her division was the afternoon contestant who had been in the humorous contest. So you have to wiggle around here and be sure. Now, what happens if you can't find these people? Well, you simply do the best that you can do. I mean, you can't stop the contest because there is nobody in her division or the division to be a judge. You got to continue on. You do the best that you can do. You find somebody that maybe is um, a past district officer. I went into a contest one time and some woman come up to me and said, oh, I can't be a judge. I'm in a club with him. Well, I had checked thoroughly and I knew that wasn't true. But she said, well, he didn't renew, but I was in a club with him when he run the area contest. Sitting at the same table was past international president, Michael Ferrero. And I said, Michael, I guess I'm going to need some help. And immediately he took up as a judge. So recruit from wherever you can. Uh, the contest must go on. Most of one of the things we talked about yesterday, we had several questions about the code of ethics. And it's all stated here that you are judging against the criteria and that you should avoid being biased in any way. And uh, they list a number of things, age, sex, race, creed, national origin, disabilities, profession, political beliefs. It all goes into integrity. And that's what Toastmasters is about, integrity. That you're judging uh, against the criteria, you're picking the person that best met their objectives, and you are not worrying about these other things. Uh, I can't tell you how many times people have voted, and I am just sure that they voted because Someone had been trying so many times and not been a winner, and they picked that person. Or it says disability. Well, I have people that will give second place to the person that has a disability, and all of a sudden, second place becomes the winner. So I try to keep talking about the criteria. What is it you're supposed to be based your information on and keep driving that home, that you should be unbiased, that you should do the best you can, pick the winner for today and pick the speech that won today. Let me uh, ask a question here, if I can, fellas. Thank you. Since we're on this topic, this was an issue yesterday mm -hmm. when we talked about uh, bias related to uh, age, sex, race, that kind of thing, particularly when it comes to sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, these are terms that are not yet in the actual document that we're looking at here. This last revision was from yeah. 2020, but I think those are things that uh, the chief judge will want to uh, make sure uh, is clear. And I'm hoping that T TI will update this because that that did come up yesterday and I'll make sure that we adjust it, that, that that is also not a basis for a judge's decision-making. Thank you. Absolutely. And I did download this sheet today. So you're right, eventually I think they will get around to talking about that. But um, 
there are just so many things that people think about when they're judging. And they should only be really thinking about the things that are on the judging ballot. I have people that think, oh, he's such a great speaker. He would be a great representative for us. No, if his speech wasn't the best one given today and met the criteria, then no, he's not to be our winner. You want your winner to be who did the best speech today. And uh, you know, no matter how great some speakers are, they're going to have off days. They can be beaten by other people. So you judge against the criteria. You don't think about any of these other bias opinions. Judge against the criteria. Pick the winner. The uh, have to warn them against timing. They think that they can uh, disqualify for timing. That is not their job. Their job is to pick a winner. If there's any problems with timing, that information the chief judge gets from the uh, timer. And confidentiality, that's a big, big word. And I stress it not only in the judge's briefing, but the timer's briefing, the vote counter's briefing, they don't have something like this to sign in the other two, in the timing or the vote counting, but they probably should be. And I like to stress it because um, there's nothing worse. It can lead into a district problem if people go out and talk about how the voting went or talk uh, about what they saw. I actually have people that come up to, to uh, judges and ask for their opinion about why they didn't win. They will go into detail wanting their friends to tell them why they, you know, they didn't win that particular contest. So at the bottom, it certifies, I am eligible to serve as a judge under the current speech contest rules and will uphold the judge's code of ethics. That means confidentiality. You sign it and you print it. Don't just sign it and print it. Mean what you sign and print. This is actually a contract. You have made a contract to do the best judging that you can do to be unbiased and to keep everything confidential. If people come up, uh, contestants, and ask you for information, tell them you signed a contract to be, uh, to have confidentiality, to not talk about how the voting was done. That if they want their time, they can talk to the chief judge. But timing is the only thing that we can give information on at a contest. So have I covered everything in the judge's briefing? I think that you have. You've done an excellent job there. We don't have any questions online, uh, but I think that's a good, great, great review of everything we need to consider as we move forward. OK, so then we're going to go back to our training. And I'm going to uh, let's see if I can get this right. The slideshow from the beginning. There we go. And we're going to the next thing that I do on the uh, judges briefing is that we learn to uh, how to do a, a protest. So these are some of the things that we do during the judges briefing. Of course, we explain how to use the ballot, reading the criteria, you know, don't time, don't disqualify. If there's anything that you think is like abusive language or subject matter, you just give them less points for that category. And if you give less points for one category, it's sure that those people are not going to be in your top. Three. Uh, your job is to pick a winner, 
pick the best speech today. Be sure and fill out three places if there were three or more winners. Sign the ballot. And of course, the chief judge always has ballots. Uh, I talked yesterday about always having ballots on your person. And I did not realize that I had to tell them when they were allowed to come and get a ballot. And that's any time other than when the contestant is speaking. I did have somebody come to me while I was at the head table, ask for a ballot after the contestant had started speaking. You know, if this happens and you spoil your ballot or you forgot to bring it to the dinner, right on the tablecloth if you have to, but you do not ever get up during a contestant speech. That's just part of being a judge or being uh, in the room. No one walks during the contestant's speaking time. So protests. This is a thing that um, many people would like to protest, but you know, if you're a judge, a voting judge, not a chief judge, a voting judge or a contestant, you can lodge a protest. And the only protest that you can lodge is for originality. The speaker is allowed to use up to 25% of someone else's content, but they must give credit to the originator. Protests must be announced before the winner. And when do you do that? Well, now there's a, a phrase in there that you can talk to the contest chair who would immediately, I think, come to the chief judge when the chief judge leaves to count the votes. That's the people are getting up, bathroom breaks, that type thing. And so it's not as noticeable as someone would come up and talk to the chief judge uh, before they leave the room even, or, you know, right after they leave the room. There are some judges that um, feel it's perfectly all right to put a note in with their ballot of why they want to protest. But a protest should remain anonymous. No one should know who lodged that protest. And everything should be handled by the chief judge. So once the protest is given to the chief judge, then the chief judge looks at it and they see all the reasons, the information why, then they are asked to call back the other judges. And simply the chief judge then tells them there's a protest, why there's a protest, information about it. And after they agree that there's questionable, then we must get information from the contestant. When did they, and I stress to all my judges that they are not to talk to the contestant. Only the chief judge will ask the contestant for information. I do not want the contestant to feel like they're being crounced upon or belittled in any way. Just we need additional information. I will tell you that at this point, I had a friend that had speech, was a great speech, and she, he, he allowed a friend to give it. Then he decided to put it in a contest. And there was a protest and he lost that contest. Nobody allowed him to come back and talk about when he wrote the speech, who knew about it, uh, was it, you know, the originality of it, and he lost it. So contestants get to say that they're peace. I mean, you cannot disqualify for something that you feel. You must give the contestant a chance. So after the contestant has his say about when he gave the speech and when 
and who might have known about it or who might have copied it or anything at all about it. Uh, he then leaves the room and at that time, the judges vote again. After the judges have voted, then we continue on with the, the vote counting. And after the notification of winners is given to the presiding officer, then the chief judge would go by and talk to the contestant and tell them, yes, there is a protest, your speech will not be allowed, or um, there is no protest and your speech is allowed. Yes, Ken. Yes, I wanted to point out we're just about out of time here. We're oh, my. I know it goes by so quickly. This is this is a great topic and there's such a there's so much information that we need to cover, but I really appreciate you handling this protest issue because a lot of people do not understand it. One of the things I would add to your discussion is that all speakers are also required to fill out a certificate of eligibility and originality. And when they sign that document, just as you said, this is a contract, uh, it's a contract with the speakers, the contestants, acknowledging that they understand they are not to plagiarize and that no more than 25% of their speech can be a uh, quote or uh, something from another speech and that must be acknowledged. So anyway, we're gonna continue with this discussion on Thursday. Again, because I think that since we're in contest season, this is very, very appropriate. And we wanna make sure that we cover it and give it as much time as it's so richly deserved. So I do appreciate that, <coughs> excuse me. And we will, we will see our audience again on Thursday. Okay. I want to remind everyone that Wake Up with Toastmasters airs on this, uh, on this Facebook page every day of the week, Monday through Friday. Uh, tomorrow on Wednesday, our host will be Jennifer Smith, I believe, our public relations manager. On Thursday, Phyllis and I will be back to continue our discussion of the chief judge's role. And then on Friday, will be our program quality director, uh, Jean Williams, with her co-host, Jean Dumper. A few things that are coming up, I want to remind folks, we did our in-person TLI, you know, and this year's the first time we've done an in-person TLI in quite some time. And what we wanted to do this year, the trio wanted to do, was to be able to offer uh, the type of TLI that would meet everyone's needs. So we are going to have an online TLI for those who are more comfortable uh, with getting their training online rather than in person. And that's coming up on January 24th at 6 p.m. Uh, there will be a flyer, I think, and a registration link sent out on that event probably in the next day or so. Uh, I think that's coming up. And uh, I, I did get a note here, Carol Wayman said, thank uh, Carol. I'm not supposed to use your last name, sorry. Carol said, thank you both. And I do appreciate your tuning in, Carol. We thank you for that. And hopefully we'll have other folks uh, on that. The other thing I wanna remind you is that coming up February 12th will be the Educational Enrichment Night. And that uh, will be at 6 p.m. on February 12th, the second Saturday of the month, as usual, goes six to eight p.m. and the uh, the topics will be published in the upcoming newsletter. So that'll be coming out on February 1st. If you have any questions, you can always email me at d115cgd at gmail.com. And also, if you would like to be a club coach, or if you would like to appear on Wake Up with Toastmasters, this is a chance for you to brag about your club and to share with us your Toastmasters journey. How did you get started in Toastmasters? Why do you stay in Toastmasters? And why do you think it's been of benefit to you? So keep in touch. Email me at d115cgd at gmail.com and I will respond as soon as I possibly can. Is there anything I forgot? Oh, game night. Game night will be the last Saturday of, of the month. <laughs> uh, and uh, that registration link will also be in the 
uh, newsletter coming up on February 1st. Anything else I've forgotten, Phyllis? Well, I've been informed that the TLI on the 24th will also have some educationals. So there's something else other than just training happening that night. Thank you so much for reminding me of that. You are correct. Although the TLI focuses on training for club officers, we do have our program quality director also arranges some educational programs for people so anyone can attend. It's not just club officers. They are pretty much required to get this training, but anyone can, can join and get an opportunity to have some really great educational programs. Again, thank you for joining us today, everyone. Hopefully you will be back tomorrow and again on Thursday where we will continue this discussion. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>